Hello, this uh, discussion is about how two very interesting thinkers thought about the future of American democracy. Now, both of them were immigrants who came to America. Both of them came from roughly the same cultural background. Both of them wrote at roughly the same time, which was a very interesting time. But both of them arrived at vastly different views about where the American political project is going. Now, these two thinkers are Hannah Arendt and Joseph Chompeta. Hannah Arendt was a German Jew who escaped Nazism and came to America. Joseph Schumpeter was not German. Uh, he was Austrian, but more or less from the Germanic cultural background, and he also escaped Nazism to come to the United States. Both of them were very active in the 40s, immediately in the second half of the 40s, after the end of the Second World War. Chompeter died in 1950-1951, if I'm not mistaken. Arendt died in 1975, so she outlived him by a quarter of a century. But more or less, they wrote at the same historical moment, that is, right after the end of the Second World War, at a time when the United States what was at the apex of its power. It was the power that had defeated fascism, not just Nazism in Germany, but also fascism in the whole of Europe. It was the power that rescued Europe economically right after the Second World War. It was really the city at, uh, at the hill, at the, the bacon, the uh, thought of as the what's the word, as the, the hope of humanity at the time. And therefore, it was the place where all their liberals thought this is really where we ought to focus on where humanity is going when it comes to sociopolitics, particularly people who had escaped Nazism, fascism, and came to the U.S. Um, as a refuge. Now, both of them had vastly different views, not just on where the American political project is going, but also on the nature of American politics. Now, the word project is probably worth reflecting upon for a second here, because both of them and many other thinkers who then, in the mid or yeah, mid-20th century until today, think of the United States not really as a static notion or entity, but rather as on a trajectory, meaning that the founding fathers who created America in the late 1700s did not really put something in place and that something remains as is today. Rather, that it was an idea, and that idea evolved and continues to evolve, and that it, its future could be very different from how it was in the late 1700s, and then during the 19th century, and then during the 20th century. More or less, everybody agrees on that. And if somebody is interested, the thinking, and often it is written actually in papers that takes place at the Supreme Court of the United States is fascinating about how many of the richest and most sophisticated minds in American uh, American politics, I would say, even if, if they would not say that they are not, not directly interfering in politics, but still the judges that sit on the Supreme Court of America are certainly some of the most sophisticated thinkers on American sociopolitics. And if you read what they write about how they justify certain rulings, what is the substantiation behind certain rulings, you would get almost a, a certainty that 
those minds see the American project as indeed a project, as on a trajectory towards further and further growth. Anyway, I'm getting out of the topic here, but the point is the idea that American democracy is progressing and responding to developments has always been on the table in America. And in the second half of the 1940s, and after that, the period when the two thinkers we are discussing today, Hannah Arendt and Joseph Schumpeter, were writing, it was a very important notion, again, because America was the rescuer of humanity in, in their minds, out of fascism, out of Nazism, out of the destruction that took place in Europe, and it was that rich, immensely vibrant, vivid, full of energy, political entity in the, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and that the liberal world at the time was looking at as a model, and as, as a guide. However, as I said, both of them arrived at, had very different views of what American politics are and where it is going. Hannah Arendt believed that the essence of American politics is not where she was living, New York. It is not on the rich, highly urban cities of the East Coast of the United States, and also not on the West Coast of the United States, Los Angeles, San Francisco, where Hollywood is, and later, of course, Silicon Valley. Not on the East, not on the West. In her view, the real essence of American sociopolitics was in the middle, in the Midwest, in, in the earlier part of the West, so Montana, for example, or Wyoming, in the South as well, South Carolina, for example, Texas. In this vast region, in between the two sides, the East Coast and the West Coast, Hannah Arendt did believe this is the essence of the American social and therefore political experiment. Why? Because there, in her view, is where the communities, the real communities of America live. The small communities that started as settlers, agricultural settlers, and later on early manufacturing, and later on the heavy manufacturing basis of America. And there, she believed the essence of the American experience is because of one particular notion, which is participatory politics. Meaning that in these communities, <clears throat> we have people, small number of people, who elect the sheriff, the policeman, who, who heads the executive force, if you'd like, of the small town, who elect the council of the little uh, town they live in, who elect the... Um, groups that participate or, 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 or orchestrate the work of the local church, say. And of course, who elect the senators who go to represent the community, the small town in, in Washington. Of course, in the state first and then in Washington, at the heart of American political decision-making. For her, that participatory politics, the bottom-up representation is the essence of American politics, not simply because it is, uh, it is a true, genuine representation of the will of the people, and therefore this is the idea of democracy, yes, but much more importantly than that, because she believed the idea of the American settlers who escaped Europe and came to this island, to this continent, I'm sorry, on the other side of the Atlantic was to organize themselves in relatively smaller communities that know each other, that take ownership of how they rule themselves, and therefore this participatory politics is not just about that they elect someone and let that person rule or represent them away from where they are for four years and then re-elect him or her or not elect him or her for her, no. The participation is that they participate in almost every level of executive decision-making. So again, in the church, 
in the local council, in the election of the sheriff, and of course in the ruling of, of the wider uh, constituency state and the United States as a bigger entity. And here the people are participating. They don't just vote and leave the person to rule again and go away and then review how he or she has uh, represented them every uh, three, four years and then keep him or her in office or kick them out. No, they do participate on almost a daily basis. And for her, the examples of the local councils, the, uh, the board of the local school where uh, teachers and parents come together, the churches, as I said, all of that for her is the seed of how America has built itself. And for her, that notion of participatory politics is also very important because it is directly linked to the constitutional convention, the gathering at the moment when the United States was born in the late 1700s in which the representatives of the different colonies all over the U.S. came together and agreed on a way to rule themselves under a constitution, under a bill of rights, under a choice of a republic, not a monarchy, for example, under the creation of a new capital at a certain place in that continent, under a system of governance, blah, 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 blah. That constitutional convention and how it was a direct representation of these different colonies and behind them the smaller constituencies and behind them the smaller towns is exactly at its core the idea of participatory politics. And in her view, the more the U.S., again remember she's writing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, in her view, the more the U.S., continues to strengthen that participatory politics, the better the idea and the notion and the practice of democracy in the US. Some would say this is a very idealistic view. And among those who would say that is Joseph Schumpeter who believed in a very realistic view of what American politics is. And in his view, America was never really a bottom-up political experiment. On the contrary, he saw it even from the very early days of the Founding Fathers, including the Constitutional Convention, as a very top-down political system in which the elite whether it's an economic elite or intellectual elite or a mix of both, they agreed on a compromise between the leaders of those colonies, between the big thinkers of those communities on how their nascent country is to be structured, what kind of system to have, how it will be ruled. And then they disseminated that to the rest of the people. And therefore, in this view, it is a very elitist way of, of thinking and of designing the political structure from day one and which continued to be like that. And in Joseph Schumpeter's view, the experience of America in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, including during the Second War, World War, strengthened that top-down nature of American politics. In his view, the Gilded Age, the massive richness that America had in the late 19th, early 20th century, strengthened further and further, more and more, the power of the economic power centers. And even after the Great Depression, and even after the loss of a lot of wealth of that elite, still the replenishment was more or less also very concentrated at the top. And that the urban elite is what really, or who really decides on the agenda of the United States, not just the political agenda, the social agenda. And he saw early on the power of the media and how it is concentrated and how that would affect 
the thinking of the vast majority of the people far away from the centers of power. And therefore, in his view, places like Washington, D.C., like New York, like San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, these massive concentration of economic and political and cultural power is where re the real American experiment is. And he was realistic enough to believe that this is where America will go, meaning that there will be further and further concentration of power in America as the decades go on. And in his view, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's not highly problematic. This does not really dilute the nature and, and the power of the American democracy, because in his view, it has always been like that. And in a way, it is okay to have that, because from this line of thinking, the idea of the enlightened leaders, not one person, but class, more or less, a group of individuals who lead their societies towards progress, who are very intellectual, who, uh, who are very aware of historical trajectories, that it is okay to have that kind of system. Now, why is this relevant today or of importance today? Because the, the massive polarization we see today in the United States and American society and politics, as well as the rise of far right and far left ideas in Europe, got lots of people to start to rethink about not just how democracy is doing today, but the nature of good governance and good governing, actually governing rather than governance, good governing. What is a good political structure? What, what are the trajectories that very established democracies have been on in the past 200 years, say, not just in the past 10, 20 years or 30 years since the end of the Cold War. Rather, let's go back, let's revisit the basics. From, from that way of looking at what, what's happening today, I think reflecting on the thinking of two people who wrote at the same time, both very rich minds, came from a relatively similar background, came to the most important country at the time, and arguably today, America, with vast influence on the politics of the world, and whose political experiment is of immense value to to the, not just to the West, but to, to the whole world, actually, how these two people reflected on that experience and arrived at vastly different views on its nature and on its future. That, to my mind, is of value to the thinking going on today about let's go back to the basics and think about democracy and what does it mean and its future in the world.